I have uh, received uh, several sources of funding to study this specific um, uh, 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 topic. I have no conflicts of interest, um, but we, we should remind everybody in the audience and families that there currently is no FDA approved treatment for infantile hemangiomas. So everything that we talk about, every single thing that we use has not been studied in, in kind of our typical manner in which we study medications for the treatment of hemangioma. All of the medications have been studied for other indications. So we do know that they can be used in children safely, but, but not specifically in hemangiomas. So just to talk a little bit about the growth characteristics, which again, um, you all live through, but they, they tend to have very subtle changes at birth, grow the first few months of life. Most hemangiomas, except for uh, some children with face syndrome, uh, they uh, will stop growing before a year of age, and then uh, the hemangioma itself will uh, spontaneously involute. Our goal of treatment is to stop the growth of the hemangioma. If we're lucky, we're able to shrink the hemangioma. Uh, many times, we just want to stop the complication. So particularly with ulceration, you may not have a very active hemangioma, but lots of ulceration. Uh, and then the, the other goal is to prevent complication. And particular complications uh, in face syndrome is usually the eye. Um, so we want to keep that eye open and, and not to damage uh, any of the structures around the eye. Um, this is a picture of a hemangioma um, from a very young baby. Um, this is what it looks like under the microscope. And, and I, I think we should probably show parents this more often. It's not a big channel of vessels like the picture that Dr. Hess was talking to you. This is fairly solid. There's lots and lots of cells trying to make blood vessels, but they're not doing that very well. Um, the yellow area is what we call a mitotic figure, so that's telling us that these cells are growing really rapidly, so rapidly that we're actually catching them in, in the, the uh, process of dividing. So this is, this is what a hemangioma will look like when you have that bright red kind of uh, uh, beefy uh, tumor uh, that you can feel in the skin uh, under the microscope. And I think this is important when we think about treatment options because we want to stop that growth. We want to stop those cells from dividing uh, in most cases. So here's a, a child who has uh, what we would call a kind of a, a simple localized hemangioma not associated with face who received no treatment and the hemangioma had spontaneously involuted a little bit of texture changes in her skin. And, and really, um, this is the majority of the kids that we see. And for a pediatrician, really the majority. So I, I know so many families come into our offices frustrated because no one took their hemangioma seriously, but, but, but that's because so few actually really need treatment. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some of our research. Um, and what we wanted to do with our initial studies is to figure out which kids needed to have treatment which kids were possibly going to have complications, and, and when a pediatrician might need to refer a child uh, with a hemangioma to someone else. So what we did is we, um, we were kind of new at doing research, and we took every baby that we saw for a year um, uh, who had a hemangioma, and we had uh, nine sites, and we enrolled 1,000 patients. Dr. Hickstrom was kind of uh, running this show and, and analyzed tons and tons of data. And what we found in our offices, and this is not a pediatrician's office, this is in a very specialized pediatric dermatologist, many of us who only see hemangiomas, um, so very um, a biased population, 25% uh, had complications, 38% um, received some type of treatment, but really the number that we're looking at is about 13% received what we call systemic therapy, which means either IV or oral medications to control the growth of hemangioma. And this is why we treated them. Ulceration, threat to vision, vision, and airway obstruction. Again, this is all patients, not just face patients. Um, and here's just a, a diagram kind of showing that. Um, so when we treat, there, there's kind of a, a, a logical progression. When we see a patient, we ask ourselves, are any of these things going to happen in the near future or potentially within the next couple months as this hemangioma grows? Is it going to cause a problem with function? Is it going to block an eye? Is it going to block an airway? Is there ulceration? 
Um, is there bleeding of the hemangioma? Which, in most cases, the skin lesions, it's not significant. We see some oozing. Um, occasionally, we can see some bleeding. Uh, but some of our kids with, with face syndrome actually had very significant bleeding during infancy uh, with lesions in their gastrointestinal tract. And then we also worry a lot about scarring. So even though we know that hemangioma is going to go away, if it grows so fast, it may stretch or damage that skin and often leaves kind of a, a scarred, fibro fatty um, uh, change. So we have to kind of be able to predict that. Um, these are the things, as I talked about, that are functional impairment. This is listed in your handout. A lot of them make, uh, make sense. The one thing I might talk about that's a little bit more specific for face syndrome is, is we are seeing some children with hemangiomas actually in their brain. Um, interestingly, so far we haven't seen a lot of complications from that, but that, that's something that's relatively new. Um, also again, we, we watch the ear canal and any problems with um, hearing, uh, and again, babies with face syndrome do appear to have a slightly increased risk of having um, an airway hemangioma, which we might have to treat. And again, just kind of a diagram, uh, a schematic diagram of, of the complications that we see, which is in your handout. So one of the things that we wanted to do, Dr. Hickson really wanted to say to the pediatricians, are there things right off the, the bat that you can say this child might have more complications for treatment? And these are uh, the things that we came up um, statistically in our group of 1,000 patients, size of hemangioma, location, and subtype. So as you might expect, the larger the size, the more complications uh, you would see. Um, the larger the size, the more often we needed to treat the patients. So uh, larger size hemangioma is often a risk factor. Location. Um, hemangiomas that are located on the face were more likely to re some, receive some form of treatment. Many of those kids were face syndrome patients. We just didn't pull out that data at that point. And then uh, Dr. Frieden talked a little bit about, again, a, a huge observation um, that, that she made is that children that have these segmental hemangiomas that cover a broad area are, are more likely to be associated with face syndrome, more likely to have complications, they're more likely to need treatment as opposed to those patients that have these very localized uh, hemangiomas. And here's an American Girl doll with a segmental hemangioma. She didn't have a lot of complications, though. <laughs> so, um, so, treatment, 11 times more likely to need treatment if you had a segmental hemangioma, uh, and eight times more likely, or complications, eight times more likely to need uh, treatment. And the other thing that is important is that these are also. Uh, increased risk for face syndrome. Um, there are also increased risk uh, for uh, some other uh, anomalies that we can see on the lower body as well. There's some question of whether or not they respond differently to treatment, uh, and, and I think we don't have enough data on that, but it's certainly something to consider when we're giving drugs. So treatment of uh, infantile hemangiomas, why is this so complicated? Uh, <clears throat> And a lot of the reasons I've discussed, so not all hemangiomas need treatment. There are different reasons for treatment. So one of the things we talked about even this morning is, is would you use a different medication for ulceration versus growth? Would you use a different medication for an eye problem versus an airway problem? So things have to be considered. Um, again, each, each child is, is very different. So there are babies that have large segmental hemangiomas that you think are going to need treatment and they don't. Their hemangioma just doesn't grow that fast. So you would never want to give one of these systemic medications to a child who doesn't need it. So often we have to wait. And, and, and a lot of you probably went through that. We'll see you next week. We'll see you in two weeks. Let's think about the treatment um, because it's so hard to predict, no matter how much experience you have. Um, we talked about the FDA. Um, and, and I think one of the reasons why we're a little bit behind the time in treatment of hemangiomas is because this is a disease that only affects infants. The medications we use to treat uh, childhood diabetes were studied in adults and then studied in kids. We can't do that. We don't have an animal model that has hemangioma. So there's a lot of barriers um, of, of being able to provide effective and safe treatment for babies. And, and then we get to face syndrome. So I, we're already worried about giving 
treatment in a child that's two months old that doesn't have a lot of these other complications that, um, uh, that face syndrome patients have. Um, one of the things I think I've done in my career is, is gained a reputation of being a worry ward. Every possible complication to a treatment for hemangioma, I'm the one that reported it. Um, and, and so I've got this bad rep, I'm like, don't do anything, you know, and so, um, uh, so, but I just want, as parents, I think you hear so many different things to know what your physicians are kind of going through. So on top of all the hard things with hemangiomas, what are the special considerations in a child with face syndrome? Well, we have to look at how old the baby is when they need treatment. A treatment in a two-week-old may be very different than a four-month-old. We have to look at how fast it's growing. We might want to use two medications if we're really worried. What's the complication? If it's ulceration, is it different than growth behind the eye? How bad is it? And, and then all of the things that uh, Dr. Hess talked about. Now we have to look at the vessels and is there a higher risk of any of these medications, not just the propranolol, um, uh, for our children with face syndrome, uh, as well as their heart abnormalities. They're on m different medications. Um, how do they, do they have surgery? Are they going to have surgery? Those, those are very, very complicated things that we have to consider. So these are our treatment options as we have now, um, at least systemic treatment options. Um, the leave it alone, uh, it won't go away, is never an option. Um, and as, as Dr. Frieden again coined, active non-intervention. So even though they're not gonna do anything, we wanna make sure that not doing anything is actually the right thing. Um, oral steroids, um, IV vincristine, interferon, uh, propranolol, uh, surgical resection, and laser therapy. Dr. Garzon's gonna talk about laser therapy. Oral steroids, I'll talk a little bit about. Um, not much about alpha interferon. It's really fallen out of favor um, unless uh, the, the children are much older, maybe greater than a year, and we can answer questions if there's specific questions. And I'll finish up with um, some thoughts about propranolol. Uh, another thing that I think often confuses parents is who, who should be treating hemangiomas? And, and, and there's a huge amount of uh, variation, and there's experts in every field, experts in plastic surgery, ENT, oncology, pediatric dermatology, uh, and even some pediatricians are very astute. And I think what we need to, to, to remember is that um, you should have a physician that cares for children. I think that's specific uh, subspecialist in pediatric. Um, you should make sure that your doctor has uh, experience in vascular anomalies. Um, and I think um, everybody would agree that if your child has face syndrome, you have to have more than one doctor. There's no way that you can make these decisions. Uh, this is our team, um, and every year it grows. Um, I don't have Dr. Frommel down here, but now that we have all these face problems with heart and, and propranolol, we had to pull in our cardiologists. We had to pull in our neurologists, our neurocognitive people. So it really, really takes a team to come up um, with the right medication for these complicated patients. So this is a child who does not have face syndrome and is a good example of how oral steroids can work. They, they can be effective. They usually stop the growth of the hemangioma. In most cases, not all. Um, in some cases, you can get lucky and it shrinks the hemangioma. Um, so, so they've been around for a long time. Um, it was first reported uh, by Dr. Esterly, another uh, uh, person you keep hearing. Um, and what she noted in a child that had asthma and a hemangioma, that child got prednisone for the asthma and the hemangioma got smaller. And we used that medication for, uh, you know, 50 years uh, because of those couple reports. Uh, pretty big doses we have to use. It often requires a long treatment. Um, we don't even know why it works. Um, we don't really have good data of how well it works and we don't have great data on safety. Um, here's a child who had an ulcerated hemangioma and had a, a steroid treatment, still has some scarring, and, and will require, or did require, um, work from our plastic surgeon, Dr. Jensen. One of the complications of, of prednisone uh, that we worry about is, is how it might decrease your immune system. And, and this is a child, um, again, that, that I reported, who had a very severe lung infection from oral steroids. Um, and uh, this is very rare, but it did make us wonder what are we actually doing to children's immune systems with these prolonged courses of steroids? And do we need to use some preventative antibiotics? Um, are the children that are getting immunized on oral steroids, um, are the immunizations taking? Um, and so these were questions that we set out to answer and we got a grant from the Society of Pediatric Dermatology and essentially what we did 
is we put kids on prednisone and we checked um, a very sophisticated um, uh, blood test to look for their T cell and B cell functions. And this is children be before they were on steroids and this is why they're on steroids. So this is actually pretty significant drops. Um, if you look at like an AIDS patient, it would probably be down in this area. So pretty significant drops. So we were actually amazed that we haven't seen more patients um, with complications. Uh, the good news is, is everything comes back to normal uh, once the kids come off the steroids. So this is not a permanent uh, effect. And this is just uh, another diagram showing a different cell line kind of dropping right about at eight weeks is really where you see it and then returning to normal. So this was just published last month um, showing that there are significant drops. Um, the really take home point I think of this is that uh, some of the immunizations were not fully effective uh, because your child was on steroids, they may have not taken the immunizations. So this is something that, that we should be checking um, and they're actually our blood tests or you can just kind of get extra boosters if your children were on oral steroids during the time uh, that they were getting most of their immunizations. The other study that we have just finished in enrolling patients is looking at vincristine versus steroids. Um, and this was supposed to enroll, um, I'm just going to go right to the a couple pictures. This is our first patient who had a dramatic response, so vincristine works. It's very hard to administer. You have to put it in a central line, a very big line, um, and it has to be administered in the hospital uh, weekly. Um, and it does have significant side effects as well. Um, we were excited because we thought maybe this was going to be safer than steroids. We didn't know. Um, here's another child who had a pretty dramatic response. This was actually on steroids. Um, and uh, the, the medication was well tolerated. We saw a little more anemia. Um, but, but as we were enrolling patients, um, there was an article in the New England Journal of Medicine about propranolol, which really just seemed like it would have a safer um, uh, uh, profile, less side effects, easier to administer. Uh, and, and so we, we were, uh, went ahead and kind of shut down um, this study as well. So uh, 2008, the oral propranolol came out. And uh, I find it very interesting. It's just like the story we had in 1968. A physician uh, noted it had a child who was being treated for other reasons. Um, hypertension and, and cardiac issues with a beta blocker happened to be in the hospital so that physician saw the, the child every day um, and noted that once they started the propranolol the hemangioma actually got smaller. We've actually had kids that have had heart disease on propranolol that I look back and I'm like yeah it probably wasn't the steroids it might have been the propranolol that actually helped. Um, so we know that propranolol is safe in children, it's been used a lot in children um, not so much studied yet in hemangiomas. Um, it is being used uh, pretty widely, uh, particularly by pediatric dermatologists, oncologists, ENT. Um, it appears to be very effective. Um, we don't know quite the, the dose um, yet that, that's going to be effective and safe. Um, most folks are using between one and three milligrams per kilogram per day. Most, mostly either one or two is where if you talk to people, but again, uh, all um, changing uh, every day. Um, most people recommend starting at a slower dose to see how it's tolerated, how the heart rate and blood pressure is tolerated. Um, and uh, of course, in our face patients, we have that extra concern um, about possibly dropping blood pressure um, or changes in the vessels that we don't yet understand from propranolol. Um, the side effects that we watch for are low blood pressure, uh, bradycardia, low heart rate, um, and low blood sugar. Um, and the hypoglycemia, uh, just because this came in as uh, quite a few questions, is something um, unfortunately happened to Alona and I on, on some of our first patients that we used it, so we reported the bad side effect. Um, but uh, I, I think that may be preventable with um, making sure that the children are eating. Uh, and thus far, there's really no method to screen for that. Um, but really uh, making sure that the, child aren't, the children are not fasting probably longer than even five or six hours is what we're recommending. And this is just uh, a little demonstration of a, a child that we recently um, used propranolol on. Um, unfortunately, here, steroids were not effective. Uh, but had a really good response, um, and you can see him here today, and he looks even better. So. Um.